The, the philosophy behind restoration is so fascinating because we need to unmanage nature, you know, like we need to return these natural processes. But at the same time, within all these constraints that we have, like roads and, you know, farmland and everything. So it's like this constant like dance between like, we need to restore certain processes, but not too much, not too far within these mm-hmm. boundaries. So I just think it's really fascinating and a huge challenge. Hey, hey, I'm Michael Yadrick, and this is Tree Hugger Podcast. This is the show where we reimagine ecological restoration, and I am here broadcasting on the occupied lands of the Puyallup people. Last summer, UW Press published Shanna Lee Hirsch's book, Anticipating Future Environments, Climate Change, Adaptive Restoration, and the Columbia River Basin. This was one of a few books I dug into this summer. My expectations are high for you, dear listeners. I recommend you read this book. I will even mail someone a copy if you can send me a direct message. I am done with it and thoroughly enjoyed it, so please liberate it from my bookshelf. I can imagine once you are done with it that it gets handed or mailed multiple more times because there is so much more in this text than just this too long, didn't read podcast version of the book. The author, Shanna Hirsch, is a research scientist in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering at University of Washington. She has an interdisciplinary background in sustainability, social science, and water management and policy. Her work draws on participatory design methods and theories from science and technology studies. She is also Associate Director of the Pacific Marine Energy Center, where she brings collaborative methods for understanding innovation to power remote communities. So in Anticipating Future Environments, Shanna investigates the Columbia River Basin of the past, the present, and takes us into the future river. We often default into talking about the river with a capital R as a singular and one large single channel of water. The Columbia is the biggest river I know, but what allows it to flow for 1,270 miles is that the basin is a fractal of hundreds of tributaries and subtributaries that feed directly into the big R rivers or indirectly into substantial systems of their own, like the Willamette, the Ponderay, the Kootenay, or the Snake. Growing up here in Washington, we have heard its stories. Its mythical character is woven into the fabric of both indigenous and settler colonial culture of my region. We often drive by it and through its territory. We swim in its tributaries. We get the benefit of relatively cheap hydropower. We eat the salmon that take a lap around the ocean and come back to spawn. We eat the apples, drink the wine. The list goes on and on. Heck, that email you were searching for from last month... Or that photo in your phone of your kid sitting in Santa's lap? Who knows, this podcast may even live in the cloud in the Dalles, Oregon, or Quincy, Washington. The basin is also home to gigantic data centers due to a combination of the cheapest energy infrastructure, developable land, and available workforce. My point is the basin ecosystem provides for us, and Shanna gets into the details about a subset of people who really care about the basin in return. Finally, a book about us. Shanna provides insights into the everyday of restoration, the tools people use, and the emergent tactics of coping and getting in right relationship with climate change, which in turn changes us and the science itself. Hirsch both investigates the shocks and awe of climate chaos like drought, wildfire, extreme flooding, as well as the slide of climate disruption like declining snowpack and shifting rainfall and more and more pleasant winter temperatures that slowly affects the ecosystem and the daily of restorationists and the larger complex of folks working on restoration of the river. Now, most restoration on the Columbia River revolves around salmon habitat restoration efforts. In April of 1990, the Shoshone-Bannock tribe petitioned the National Marine Fisheries Service to list the sockeye as an endangered species. The Shoshone-Bannock Reservation is in southeastern Idaho, and their members historically fished in the headwaters area of the Salmon River. Two months later, petitions to list Snake River, Spring, Summer, and Fall Chinook as threatened species were filed by a coalition of environmental groups. Through the 1990s, 
one salmon or steelhead population after another was listed for protection under the ESA as run sizes continued to decline. Kootenay River white sturgeon and bull trout also were listed for protection. Eventually, the Columbia River Basin salmon and steelhead listings totaled 12. When I first studied the Columbia River, these listings were pretty new. We learned about the impacts from the four H's, harvest, habitat, hydroelectric, and hatcheries. Complex outcomes arrive from these interactions we have with the river. We remove too many fish, we degrade the streams, we block their passage with dams straight out of science fiction that also makes rivers into reservoirs that seem to stand still. We flood the rivers with non-wild fish to mitigate for the losses I just named, particularly from hydropower. Then throw the changing ocean conditions in there on top of that. Climate disruption is also the multiplier that exacerbates everything. While we go about extincting the salmon and altering other parts of the ecosystem that support us, there is something to be said about adaptation. I am tempted to call the Columbia River ecosystem and the salmon fragile, but the water continues to flow and the salmon survive and return and persist despite what we throw at them. Extinction is almost there for some species of salmon, but they turn back. So the underlying theme in Shanna Hirsch's book is change. She illuminates the curiosity, hopefulness, and socio-technical imaginary that influences the uniquely human style of adaptation in a warming world. Within the current system, people are trying to help. People love salmon. People love this place. The strength of the river restoration is really the strength of that relationship with the fish and their connection with everything else. The restoration effort combines that love, the human wherewithal, and resilience through adaptation. So in my discussion with Shanna Hirsch, we discuss the imaginary of the river as an organic machine, how epistemic communities produce knowledge, infrastructure, and institutions to carry out the science and practice of restoration, how the interplay between science and policy has helped or hindered the river restoration, lessons learned from engineering-based and process-based restoration debates and strategies, we reflect on the weather of 2015 as what we might experience as a future baseline. What does an unstable climate mean for restorationists when we reconsider goals and rethink tactics in the shifting paradigm of restoration in the basin? Here you go. It starts right here. Enjoy this episode with Shanna Lee Hirsch. Yeah, hopefully, right. hopefully okay. my uh, roosters won't start growing while we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. Actually, that's super organic. That's natural. Right. These days, I totally, there's no expectations for a total <laughs> studio, like the studio sound. Right. Oh, man. Yeah, I was like, trying I to record like a talk the other day, like a pre-recorded talk, and my rooster just kept growing. And I'm like, this talk is I'm for people for in it. Washington, D.C. They're not going to like understand. And they're like, where are you? Rooster's growing. So uh, <laughs> That's awesome that you have roosters. I read somewhere, you live in Vashon, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm in Tacoma right now, so I can probably... If it wasn't so foggy, we could maybe we could wave at each yeah. other. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I yeah. was interested in where the inspiration for the book came from and where your interest in restoration started. This all began as kind of a inspiration on a long drive, I suppose, because uh, I was researching water management in the Columbia River Basin. I was living in Moscow, Idaho at the time. And I was in driving back and forth between Eastern Washington and Western Washington a lot. So on this long drive, I was thinking about the complexity of water management in the Columbia River Basin. And it just was overwhelming me. I was, you know, I was seeing all these different ecosystems and all these different uses of the land and all of these different people who wanted to use the water in different ways. You drive past these, you know, huge hydropower dams, mega dams. And I just had hours to think about what was happening here and trying to understand water law, water policy and water management in the basin. And I just became fascinated with the complexity of the problem. And I thought, you know, how are all these people dealing with this complex problem with then climate change layered on top of it. 
And, you know, they're still working. They're still moving forward. They're trying to restore salmon habitat. They're trying to restore salmon to the river, to the Columbia River Basin. And I just thought, what are, how are those people actually dealing with this? And so I wanted to talk to the people who were, you know, still working, still moving forward and, and trying to restore the river in the face of such complexity and such dire problems with climate change. And that was the that was around 2013, 2014, 2015 was the time when I started thinking about this book. And a lot of the effects of climate change were starting to become regular. We had really we had a hmm. snowless winter, we had drought, wildfire, and so everything started to become very real, I think. So that was how I kind of got interested in the complex problem. In restoration in particular, it's been an interest of mine for my whole life. I'm not a restoration ecologist. I'm a social scientist. I study policy. But as kind of a personal interest, I've always been interested in restoration and conservation and in the environment and in the environmental movement. But I kind of grew up. It's kind of funny that this this podcast is called tree hugger, actually, because that word means something very uh, visceral to me because my family Mm. were were loggers. And so I kind of grew up with this in this funny world where there was, you know, this logging, (laughs) clear cutting, having these really strong impacts on the environment, you know, in my family, family's business and seeing this and then also having this this environmental awareness and consciousness and radicalism at times, you know, to try to restore the environment. So I guess I've just been interested in how humans manipulate the environment in many different ways. <laughs> right. I did see that very briefly. I mean, you did talk about yourself a little bit in the in the beginning of the book. I did see that your family had that logging operation and yeah, and then I assume you seem younger than me, but yeah, that was very, those were uh, kind of confusing times since I think during, at least I don't know when it was like either, I want to say like late nineties. Did you kind of live through that? Like the oh, timber yeah, wars yeah. and that yeah, sort of thing was absolutely. going on? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's serious. I actually almost, I don't know if you're a fan of podcasts, but I almost sent you this link. I started listening to this really good one. It's called Timber Wars. So it's oh. put out by OPB, um, Oregon Public Broadcasting. I don't know if you're a fan of podcasts, but it's a good listen. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, because yeah. it talks about like the science plus all the all the feelings associated with it. So the tree hugger name, it was I just talked about this. Well, I have a little bit of info on the on my website about it. I was talking about it with the form with the guest earlier in the month. Cause it also has its origins like in India, right? Oh you wow. Know, from the it's like Chipko movement. That name was adopted and it's has pretty rich history but yeah in more recent times it became more of a like a derogatory sort of yeah sort yeah of a, sort of name i don't mind being but a tree hugger though i sort of adopted the name because my my dad for like so many years he's just called me a professional tree hugger uh-huh. like he just was not really sure what I do is sort right. of like a term. It's, I think it's a term of endearment to a certain extent, but I don't worry about it too much anymore. And then living in Moscow, I'm sure. I mean, you're basically like living in the basin and driving. If we go into the west side of the mountains, I mean, you're essentially in the basin almost the entire time. And yeah. I don't think for all the listeners may not understand how massive the Columbia River Basin is. Can you describe it for us and tell us how it operates as yeah. like such an organic machine? And this term you use is, and you use a term, but I think you cite Richard White. And I, I read his book so long ago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed to say, I think it was like actually when it was published, like it mm-hmm. was something I was reading in college. So I, I had very, we had several, numerous classes, which went in and talked about the Columbia River Basin. But so I'm sort of familiar with it. And actually, my stepdad, his family was from there, too. So we spent like time in like around Grand Coulee. Right. Damn, like all like all summers. So it's I have some personal history with it, but I don't think anyone else really knows too much. Yeah, you could just kind of describe it for us. 
Yeah, so the Columbia River Basin, and I think even a lot of people who live in, you know, west of the Cascades in Washington and Oregon don't probably understand the vastness of the Columbia River Basin, which I didn't understand, you know, completely either until I started driving across it. So it it's uh, about the size of France, the Columbia River Basin. It includes the Columbia River and the Snake River are the two main stems. But there are, you know, numerous other large rivers, the Kootenay, I could go on and on, that all feed into the Columbia River Basin, all coming out at the mouth between Oregon and Washington. So it's it's most of Washington, you know, east of the Cascades, up into British Columbia, about a third of it's up in British Columbia. It goes all the way into Montana, most of Idaho, all the way up into Yellowstone, most of Oregon, a tiny little bit of Utah. So it is it is a massive area. And the the scale of the river is huge, but the scale of the projects that people proposed in the early in the first half of the 1900s are also incredible because they, you know, proposed these massive hydropower projects and irrigation projects. And that's what Richard White is speaking about in his book, The Organic Machine, which was written in 1999. It's an excellent book. It's really short. It's simple. He's an environmental historian, and I highly recommend it. He talks about how the river became this kind of hybrid of nature and technology through the way that people developed it creating the hydropower dams, the Grand Coulee obviously being the you know most famous, but a series of hydropower dams up and down the Columbia and Snake Rivers that are really, they were the biggest in the world for a long time there. And it's a massive, on a massive scale. And not only that, but then the irrigation projects, such as the Columbia Basin Project that irrigated, you know, the desert, a large part of Washington and made Washington one of the fruit growing capitals of the world. And then as well, large irrigation projects across Idaho, you know, the Snake River Plain was irrigated all from water taken from the Snake River, which is feeding into the Columbia. And so this idea of the of the organic machine is that some aspects of the river are still natural. You know, the river is still flowing, the rain is coming down the mountains, the snow is melting, it's flowing down the river, there's fish swimming up the river, there's this large part of it that is a natural system still, but it's managed and controlled by humans in such a way as to produce energy. And I love the way that he talks about energy in the river, that there's like all of the human labor that went into creating the dams and now into managing the cycles of the river there's the river itself and, you know, the water flowing down, creating energy. There's the labor of the salmon as they swim up the river, down the river, you know, and that's expended through their, through the fat that they gather in the ocean. So he's really talking about this way that there's this hybrid kind of cyborg system of nature and humans, and that's the organic machine. I also really like how it touches on this piece about which we talk about called socio-technical, which is the social and the technical combined. So it's science. And the way that science is done is both socially constructed and it's technical in the way that people conduct it. So it's similar. The social technical is kind of similar to how nature and dams are kind of co-produced into this organic machine. I do find, and when I was a kid going over to like Grand Coulee Dam and visiting those places like on road trips during the summers with family, I mean, those were like the major vacations that I took. And I remember Mm -hmm. just being like sort of awestruck by the um, enormity of the dam and going on the tour, like inside the belly and the guts, you know, of the dam was just incredible to me. And, you know, at that time... I was just really becoming aware of how important the the salmon were as well and how the dams like disrupted their, their journey up the river. Mm -hmm. Just about everything needs restoration these days, but what drives restoration in the Columbia Basin? Is it mostly centered around salmon? Well, most of the restoration money is coming from mitigation for the damage that the dams are doing. 
So in that sense, it is damage to salmon populations. So that's driving a lot of the money coming from the BPA and other federal and state entities. In that sense, it is aimed at salmon because of the legal structure. But of course, salmon need habitat. And so the habitat can be, you know, forests, beavers, anything that is going to be supporting salmon. So right now there's 12 listings Mm -hmm. uh, of Columbia River Basin salmon and steelhead that are listed under Endangered Species Act. So, you know, starting in kind of 1991 up until the late 90s, like Snake River Sockeye, Lower Columbia Chinook, Mm -hmm. Upper Willamette Chinook, Middle Columbia River Steelhead, et cetera. And it seems like the listing, you know, even though the Endangered Species Act goes back to like 1973, it wasn't until 1990 that the Shoshone Bannock tribe kind of made a move to start petition the National Marine Fishery Service for the listings. So it's fairly, seems like in the last 20 or 30 years, actually, that restoration really kind of hyped up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I mean, before that, there were people restoring the river, but the way that like the Army Corps of Engineers imagined the restoration of the river was not the ecological restoration that we imagine today. Instead, and I, I wouldn't call it restoration, they were, you know, clearing streams of debris. They thought that helping the river to flow out by cleaning it out and making it lining it with concrete in some instances, you know, would be the way to help the river get out to the ocean. So in that sense, there were people manipulating the river and trying to improve it the way that they thought that they would improve it. But that wasn't, that was environmentally destructive, we now know. It was just like, they were just trying to like speed the water along, right? Instead yeah. of like trying to slow it down. Right, it was like exactly. making it like a slip and, a slip and slide instead yeah. of, instead of yeah. a maze. Yeah, because was well, they were focused on, yeah, getting the water out, you know, to where it should go, you know, right. preventing flooding or, you know, or whatever. It, yeah, so. and I remember stories in the history of the river too, where flood control was super important, you know, through colonialism and settlement in the basin, like flood control was super huge, like, like floodwaters used to, they were like wiping out entire towns and there's yeah. these myths you know about that it would happen again yeah I mean, well it's... that's what some of the big dams went in right after the flood in portland i think it was 1948 and that was a devastating flood for portland so for instance like the dwarshack dam was built after that in idaho to as a flood prevention dam it's a, it's a complex system where it was like some of the dams were built for irrigation some for flood control some for energy yeah Back to the organic machine again. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so how has the interplay between science and policy helped or hindered river restoration? So I think you, uh, do you discuss in your book that, you know, going back into the, I guess, early 1900s, there was a biologist starting to study salmon biology and then in different waves, you know, the conservation movement was centered around like sportsmen, like sports Mm -hmm. or like fishing and angling and hunting and that sort of thing. How has that evolved until today? Yeah, so a lot of what I end up tracing in the book is kind of how how scientists approach salmon restoration. And they started out by, you know, first of all, people just wanted to understand like, where are these salmon going? Like they didn't understand that they, you know, even where they went to return to their, you know, headwater streams, they didn't understand separate populations. And a lot of what was happening was just counting fish. They called it counting fish in and fish out, right? So this, I trace kind of the story of one of the early scientists in the basin, Harlan Holmes. He travels around and he's going to canneries along the Columbia River and kind of you know, trying to encourage people to measure the salmon, count the salmon, tag the salmon, and try to understand like where they are and how many there are and what they are doing. Even the like those early scientists in the early 1900s and the 20s and 30s were concerned because populations were plummeting. And that could easily be seen, you know, at the canneries. So 
the early science was really focused on this kind of counting and measuring. And I kind of discussed the ways that it has continued on through, through time. Even now, one of the ways that we understand salmon recovery is by counting them, you know, and counting different populations. Now we obviously have more of an understanding of the different populations of, of salmon to some extent, you know, that there are different runs, different times, different cycles that we need to pay attention to. But the Endangered Species Act, and we're incredibly lucky to have it, and I in no way want to, you know, poke holes in it at all. We're, we're very fortunate to have strong environmental laws here in the United States. But it can be, you know, inflexible at times. Like it's based upon counting population numbers and species. And it's difficult sometimes. We have protections for habitats. But the complexity of habitats that support salmon might not be entirely encompassed in something like the Endangered Species Act. So I discussed, I use the term co-production, which comes from Sheila Jasanoff in Science Studies. And she discusses kind of the way that we know the world through science, through epistemology, and how that's bound up with the way that we act and we regulate the world through environmental policy in this case. So it really matters, you know, what we're measuring, what we're counting, what kind of data we have, and how we understand the environment, because that is how we regulate the environment. And those are the numbers. And those are the that's the science that's going into the courts. And those that's what's being debated in terms of protection for fish. So it matters how we understand the environment, because that's kind of how we're going to be measuring the environment and measuring our success. So for instance, one of the things that I talk about in the book is like we're managing the Columbia River Basin for the purpose of having a hydropower system, not necessarily for a river that's its highest use is for salmon. So we, we're setting the standard already and how we imagine the environment is going to impact how we, how we manage the environment. It does to me because, of course, yeah, the dams... Right now, even though there is a little bit of precedent now for taking ta- dams down, they mm-hmm. the ones on the the ones on the Columbia River are so massive, and there's so many of them wow. that I can imagine gray infrastructure has a lifetime, and maybe some will come down. I don't yeah. know in my lifetime, but and maybe in my son's lifetime. And you talk about this quite a bit. These this idea of baselines that we, as restorationists, we consider think about either it's historical fidelity, but we're at this point in time, we're never getting the the early river back. And right. so basically we're starting from that the baseline that there are dams and trying to negotiate restoration with the dams in mind. And now trying to also explore how to do restoration with as climate change impacts are become more severe. Yeah, absolutely. So the baseline is shifting out from under us while we're while we're working on this huge project. And also, I mean, the baseline is going to be different wherever you are in the in the basin as well, right? Because some people are going to be like really focused on having, you know, their agriculture and irrigation and other people are going to be focused on maybe recreation or whatever. And then you have, you know, tribes who want salmon coming back as their number one goal. So, you know, you have all of these different baselines kind of, and then overlaid on top of that, yeah, you have climate change. It's changing it. Even though I don't do river restoration, it was, I feel like you understand me to a certain extent Uh i don't know if you know like just the words you're using it's like she speaks my language Mm -hmm. and you describe the restoration community the larger restoration community as you know restoration ecologists the tribal members the indigenous scientists the the land managers as an epistemic community can you describe like really what that means and how we go about or people in the basin at least go about producing knowledge and the infrastructure and the institutions to carry out the science and practice of restoration. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm glad that you found that term helpful. I was really reticent to, you know, talk about epistemology and ontology and things like this in in a book that I wanted to have a wide audience for. But I come from my background is a lot in science and technology studies. So we're talking about epistemic communities a lot. And what are those? So epistemic communities are communities of expertise. So it's a group of people that are recognized as being able to make claims about the world. And so there can be lots of different kinds of communities of experts or epistemic communities. You know, they may be focused on, you know, you'd have a community that's focused on, you know, astrophysics or whatever. But in this case, it's the all of the people that are involved in making claims about what to do about restoration in the Columbia River Basin. So I think that that's a broad group of people. And you might find those people at, say, a River Restoration Northwest Conference or a SER conference. You could find the conversations in the journals around restoration But you'd also find them, you know, at meetings, salmon recovery meetings, community meetings that are bringing people together to talk about these problems. So it's not just scientists or restorationists, but it's also all of the people who are trying to understand and grapple with this problem and create, produce knowledge about it, but also create infrastructures and institutions that are going to enable people to to move forward in managing the environment and conducting restoration. So for me, it's a helpful perspective to think about epistemic communities because it extends beyond just science to include, you know, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge about the river. And so it includes knowledge that might not otherwise be included in science. What I like about the book, obviously, is yeah, you go, you get really deep into drawing from the, you know, the sociology but also mixing in like the restoration ecology, not just the technical aspects, but the human stories behind it as well. And I imagine you interviewed so many more people that were somewhat anonymous in the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. sort of referred to very <laughs> ambiguously. But then there are these like very heartwarming stories from people who have you know spent thousands of hours in the actual in their science or in their practice which I appreciated. Yeah, just being able to elevate those voices. I think it's incredible. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to do this in a way is because after talking to everyone, originally, when you're interviewing people, and you have to, you have to follow certain protocols, and it has to be anonymous. But after conducting all of these interviews, I just wanted these people's stories to be heard. And I wanted their names to be out there, you know, so particular people, I said, you know, can I use can I use your name here because this is just an incredible story and want to honor it. Do you know like generally about how many folks you interviewed and like how far you traveled mm, doing all these I, interviews cuz you are on yeah. a streak by the way. I don't know where you, I don't know where you came from but all of a sudden like this book comes out and you know I feel like it's a restoration book so I do want to I do want people to know about it but then you have been writing like crazy it seems like the last few years yeah yeah I have been and this is the first first book that I've written but I've been writing a lot of articles as well I yeah I did I can't remember the exact number of interviews now I think it was like 50 or so long interviews but yeah I mean I traveled to so many conferences and restoration sites and went on walking tours of restoration sites with with people and managers but over the course of 4 years I traveled about 50 I put 50,000 miles on my car <laughs> which is you yeah. know not great for climate change but it was a very energy fuel efficient car so <laughs> oh is it is it like yeah. a, a Prius or, or a Subaru no, or something? No, it was a Suzuki <laughs> SX4, which has four-wheel drive and Woo-hoo. can get over mountain passes nice. in snowstorms. So yeah. I was like, right. you know, driving around with the snow tires on, going over all these passes. Yeah, and, uh, totally. It's the size of France. So it's the size of its own. It's like, it's basically its own country mm-hmm. all by itself. And it is an amazing place. Like there is like wetlands and deserts and like you said, fruit 
and yeah. it's like the bread basket and there's wine and all this yeah. it's like a, it is a great place it's a great part of the country it is. A great part of the world and so you do discuss too some of the great debates in restoration uh-huh. and not only like general restoration but in river restoration specifically so i mean you touch on novel ecosystems and ecosystem services and the river restoration itself, the strategies between like engineering based versus mm-hmm. process based restoration. And then really most recently is something that's popped up is called what people refer to and have kind of a paradigm shifter is stage zero restoration. So is there any lessons learned and how these the tug and pull of these different debates and strategies has played out in the basin? From a from a sociological perspective, these kind of debates are really interesting because you have you know the, <laughs> you have this epistemic community here, right, of people who are all like trying to you know claim expertise, and then there's these kind of but there's also these kind of battles between ideas, and you know they're just always going to come up. Like there's always going to be some difference in in perspective, and that's happened through science through the whole history of the basin. When I was delving into it, this big debate is you know is kind of between engineering based restoration, which is I'm and I'm going to caricature these here, which you know would be like let's restore the stream bed, you know let's make a big engineering drawing, maybe like have some kind of pumps or some, you know, pipes and we're going to we're going to like return the the river to what it was just, you know, in in this week of construction, we're going to bring in bulldozers and swales and rocks and it's expensive and it's big. And then process-based restoration which would be like more like let's let the stream do the work and restore the functioning system, you know, and it's going to be more focused on like planting, releasing water, letting the stream kind of meander where it wants to. And that's obviously like a big caricature of both of those things. Because in reality, you know, what I found out is that most restorations are kind of using a little bit of both, right? And so like often you, people are just going to be making kind of compromises because wherever you are, there's going to be some, you might have to protect some landowners, which you can't just release a stream and let it go wild if there's a landowner there or a road. Or you might, you might have to deal with certain constraints, you know, funding constraints or whatever. So a lot of people are just kind of like doing what they can in reality, right? And in a lot of times, people, now that there's this pressure of climate change, there might not be time to wait to restore the stream functioning. You know, it may be a case that like, these little pocket ecosystems need water now. And the fastest way to do that is to kind of, you know, reroute a stream through a pipe. And so that's the only way to get cold water there. And so we're just going to do this now. And so I kind of saw people just pulling from both toolboxes and doing whatever they could. They have the same goal in the end, which is to restore salmon or keep them alive, you know, long enough so there'll be salmon in the future. So I, th- I found it really interesting that people were just kind of pulling from both toolboxes. And one of the examples that I give in the book is kind of the example of beaver restoration. Beaver are like the ultimate kind of process-based restoration. You release some beavers and they'll go out into the forest and start to complexify the, the streams. But in reality, a lot of people don't have time to wait for the beavers to do that. So, or they maybe don't want beavers to, you know, just go wild and destroy somebody's, you know, apple orchard or whatever through flooding. So people might create uh, beaver dam analogs, which are engineered beaver dams, which may be meant to attract beavers or maybe just emulate what beavers do. So to me, that's kind of this ultimate mixture of process-based and engineering-based restoration is kind of like engineering beaver dams. And I think that the stage zero idea is really fascinating because it's really recognizing the complexity in streams and recognizing the complexity of the environment and taking a step back from kind of like the Rosgen, you know, stream channel model and saying like, this is a very complex system and there's going to be times where we need to just kind of revert to a very basic forest wetland or something like that. So I don't know, I, th- I just found it really fascinating that people were just kind of taking what they had, you know, as tools and working with them. 
the infrastructure that goes along to support the work and that's like knowledge, like institutional knowledge that carries mm-hmm. forward and then just like technology, technology, like hard technology, like drones all of a sudden mm-hmm. are a thing. And mm-hmm. then, and then the throwback and then, yeah, now we're going to use beavers as our agents of right. restoration. <laughs> and I just really did appreciate. And it's so compelling or it is uh, fascinating to think about this mythical sort of restorationist in my mind. That's like uh-huh. very improvisational and experimental using beavers. There's just, you're encouraging like unpredictability. Mm-hmm. And that's just so fascinating to me. And because so much we're trying to control nature and we want to be able to design and control things and see our design sort of play out in real in real time or into the future. And in some ways, all this kind of intelligent tinkering is part mm-hmm. of the practice. And more and more, it could be embraced more and more as climate change is just so uncertain. The the philosophy behind restoration is so fascinating because we need to unmanage nature, you know, like we need to return these natural processes. But at the same time, within all these constraints that we have, like roads and, you know, farmland and everything. So it's like this constant like dance between like, we need to restore certain processes, but not too much, not too far within these boundaries. So I just think it's really fascinating and a huge challenge. I mean, really, the overarching theme in the book is is climate change. But you, in the title of the book, I didn't really realize until until the end. I mean, you use this term anticipation or anticipating future climates, mm-hmm. and that's actually kind of seeded in your the framework you use to study mm-hmm. the restoration in the basin, and so much of what we do. And I've been thinking about this, like with adaptation or what I think we're doing to adapt to climate change is antis- trying to anticipate and using certain tools available to us, like models to like try to guess what's mm-hmm. going to happen, even though our climate is unstable. So you do in the book really focus on the year of 2015. So mm-hmm. I guess reflecting on the weather of either it was like late 2014 into 2015 or the water year of 2014, 2015, mm-hmm. it seems like what we might be experiencing or what people are setting as a baseline now for what to expect in the future. What do you think this kind of the new norm? I I don't know if this is cliche, but this new normal means mm-hmm. for restorationists when they're reconsidering goals and tactics and the shifting restoration paradigm. I guess I don't want to say it's a good thing, but it was an interesting element that while I was studying this, we had, you know, one of the most extreme weather years, 2015, yeah, the winter then. And it was, I I do think it was kind of a, a lot of people are saying that it's kind of a, a little bit of a crystal ball into what the future is going to be looking like according to climate models. So we're looking at, you know, more extreme events, less snowpack, drier, hotter summers, wetter warmer winters, more wildfires, on and on. So this is going to be mean a lot of problems for salmon. We had huge die-offs that year because the water temperature was too warm um, for them to survive in the main stem of the Columbia. So it's devastating, really, that what we need to have now is we need cool water more than anything. And that you know, reduction of snowpack for which is acting as storage for the winter and into the spring and, re, you know, releasing cool water for salmon all through the summer as well in a lot of areas. We're, lo- we're going to be losing that. So, what we really need now is cool water. We need shade. We need, you know, to recognize the complexity of groundwater need to connect to it and find those cold water seeps and make sure that they're getting into the river. Of course, there's the problem of the fact that the main stem is a series of lakes that get very warm. But even just looking up into the headwaters, you know, and focusing on them and ensuring, you know, that we take them into account because they're going to be more important. The fish are going to need access to these colder areas. And fortunately, a lot of the headwaters in this region are located on federal and state lands. We can have, you know, some protection, hopefully, for for some of those headwater environments and the cold water that will hopefully still be there. 
things that I did see people doing, you know, were, were interesting. There were people kind of looking to plant for the future, like taking into account that maybe different tree uh, species were going to, their ranges are going to shift or that, you know, maybe in up in Northern Washington, we need to start thinking about planting some trees that are maybe more down in Oregon or something like that. And also thinking about how, how salmonids are also, their range is going to shift. So there were some people kind of looking to the future and anticipating either through modeling or sometimes just very kind of off the cuff, like, well, I'm going to try this out. I visited one restoration site where they said, okay, we're just going to, we're going to try planting, planting some different plants here that would be more, you know, from a warmer climate and see what happens because these plants are not going to mature for 50 years. So let's just, let's just try it and see. And a lot of that stuff is going on and it's not like, necessarily public you know like it's not part of the plan it's a little bit of an experiment and I think those kind of like little anticipatory experiments are really what's gonna drive innovation in restoration yep yeah working with vegetation I think we're trying some of those same things and we're may not be using like separate species Mm -hmm. that are out of what we think are the historic or the current range right now Mm -hmm. but just pulling genotypes mm-hmm. from further south like so in like heading towards the direction of change mm-hmm. and plant out planting those like same species they look pretty much exactly yeah. the same but they're basically like organ trees right right <laughs> not like it's going to solve climate change but it may be they may be think the thinking i guess is that they may be pre-adapted to right. the warmer climate It's interesting working in river restoration. You need water for one. Mm -hmm. And so the variability in the water year can make huge differences. Like either the presence of water, like thinking like you think you have a like a a sweat site that's fairly wet, but then you're Mm -hmm. transitioning and trying to plant out now, thinking just species that tolerate much drier conditions. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of risk involved. And I think depending upon your perspective on risk it can really dictate what you do on the ground yeah yeah absolutely and also yeah what you're like legally allowed to do I mean I think that it's it's interesting to see the different tactics that people use and water you bring up a huge issue I mean the really when you're talking about river restoration and salmon one of the, the big issue here is like water is to have cold water for them to survive Right. And so just turning to really creative water law, you know, Western water law is really complex and I don't really want to get into it because I'll be quickly out of my depth. But thinking about some of the creative ways you can kind of have water shares traded or things like that to kind of bring in water when you really need it at a really critical time for for salmon. I think that those kind of those kind of tactics are going to be a key part of restoration in the future in the Columbia River mm. Basin. I think you did touch on, and we don't have to delve into Western water law, but particularly <laughs> like with the Endangered Species Act, people may not be looking necessarily towards historic baselines anymore, and they may be kind of aligning themselves more with like a novel ecosystem framework. I think you, what you noted written before is, as it becomes increasingly more apparent, I'm just going to say your words back to you in a paper I was reading is that the Endangered Species Act usually drawing on historic baselines. So as a no as a no analog future and present becomes increasingly apparent, restorationists and environmental managers are struggling to determine the best way to measure success and failure. So even Mm -hmm. though like the Endangered Species Act is based on really presupposing that we're using historic baselines. There's a cascading effect with climate change now where monitoring becomes different Mm -hmm. and this type of restoration or the the goals are shifting now over time. And the law that kind of dictates the funding and how you can operate is may no longer be really relevant. Or it needs to be strengthened even more, right? To like Mm -hmm. say, you know, we need to take into account the impacts, the layered impacts of the dams and climate change on these salmon populations, right? And then we need to, you know, mitigate for that, not just for the dams. So these laws are created by people and we continue to use them and we can continue to push for uh, them to be used in particular ways, you know? So I think that that's going to be a key part of the the future is going to be 
relying on some of these fairly strong environmental laws that we have here to make sure that there's going to be salmon in the future. So one last thing I was interested in the kind of the interplay between the indigenous science and sort of indigenous governance and how that relates to, it seems like there's a lot of pressure and the reason why some of the um, endangered species listings came to be is because of pressure from basically tribal nations to Mm -hmm. assert their, their rights Mm -hmm. to, to salmon and some of their other rights that they had negotiated in some treaties, you know, from the Wayback Machine. How do the tribes now interact these days? And how do you see that sort of changing in the future? Yeah, so I think that they have a, a really important role to play, obviously. I think this is this is about, you know, environmental justice. And we're looking at all of these parts of our society now that are pushing back and looking for justice, you know, in so many different domains. And one of these is, I think, the environmental justice domain where we have to go, okay, you know, this river has been managed with this imaginary of this organic machine for hundreds of years by colonial settlers. And there are these treaties that tribes have that have been like mostly ignored and they have a different environmental imaginary of the river. and. Maybe it's time to take a step back and allow these other imaginaries to take hold and say, what do you see the future of the river looking like? That would be an environmentally just and a ethical thing to do, <laughs> would be to say, let's, let's make some space for these other perspectives and other imaginaries of the river. So I think that the, you know, the reasserting tribal treaty rights is starting to make a huge impact on the way that the general population imagines the river as well. And I hope that that gets strengthened in the future. I think that that's a really hopeful, a hopeful movement to look to. I can't imagine salmon are so sacred to the Pacific Northwest and our culture, not just for the tribes Mm -hmm. and and the first peoples, but it sort of bled into the culture at large and it is, you know, back in the day, the seeing this transition from canneries who used to just like scoop up salmon mm-hmm. by, you know, the tons yeah. um, until now where basically runs are just so depleted or you don't see any fish some years because of how complex their life cycle is. Like it's not just like the, the temperature of the river, the main stem, but it's like this warm blob that floats around yeah. the Pacific Ocean that doesn't allow yeah. for the upwelling to occur and, you know, so much so. Yeah, we haven't um, even talked about oh, yeah. <laughs> the ocean. <laughs> yeah. Back in the day when I was yeah, when I was in college, at least when we were studying the river, it's like climate change was not really really spoken about. It was just like this emerging mm-hmm. little rumor, <laughs> really. Mm-hmm. And I don't even think it like that climate change, that term uh, shows up in the organic in Richard White's book in the organic machine. Right. Things are changing. Absolutely. All right. I always ask folks on that come on the podcast what their favorite tree is. Uh-huh. So coming coming from the, you gave me a little tidbit about your family, so I bet I'm waiting for. I know you have a good one. Or- my favorite tree. So I took this as like not my favorite type of tree, but my actual favorite tree, which is the which is a huge monkey puzzle tree that I have in my yard. It's like about two feet in diameter at least and I think it was it was planted in there was like a world's fair in Seattle in like I want to say like 1918 or something Mm -hmm. and they like gave away seedlings of monkey puzzle trees and so really planted them all over the yeah all over the region there's these huge monkey puzzle trees because they were all like planted as seedlings way back then so it's like a hundred years old Wow, and it goes back to the World's Fair, huh? I've yeah. never heard that anecdote. No, yeah. I know there are. It seems to be these monkey puzzle trees that are very similar in height mm-hmm. and size around the Puget Sound, but yeah. I've never heard the World's Fair connection. Yeah, huh. I mean, I mean I, that this is hearsay at this point, but I believe it. <laughs> no, it, I yeah, no, I wouldn't doubt it. You are not the first one to say monkey puzzle, by the way. Oh. Really? Um, right. Cool. Yeah. Cool. No, other people note how incredible they are. 
Yeah. That's mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And they are, yeah. I had a special, and last time I remember talking with my other guests too, I remember uh, my story about monkey puzzles. At some point I was in Argentina, I was in South America, mm-hmm. like after my Peace Corps stint and we were traveling, I was traveling around and I was trying to find monkey puzzles. Like I was like, we're uh, so close to the range. Yeah. And I remember driving in these back roads in this little, like little baby rental car. Like not your Suzuki or whatever that has four yeah. wheel drive, but like in these back roads of this, like I was just waiting for it to get a flat tire. And we were like hours down this like back roads and trying to find monkey puzzle trees. And I just thought we'd turn the corner and just like it'd see monkey puzzles, but I never did. I've seen um, some in Chile before, so they do. They have do you? Exist, yeah, I know. But... I think they're properly in Chile. I was on the wrong yeah. side of the on the wrong side of the Andes. Yeah, looking for them. I think ending on this thing about the imaginaries is really mm-hmm. is really key and you leave it in the book and you just started to touch on it a little bit and using this term I don't know where this term imaginaries comes yeah. really from and because it seems sort of mystical but I think it's b- embedded in some sort of other like <laughs> academic framework too but well, I do think that's really powerful and like you said you're either you're not a restorationist and you don't want to make like assertions but I think you have some important key takeaways takeaways but you don't want to like say well we need to be doing doing beaver dam analogs right across the whole place <laughs> and then stage zero is the answer any sort of lessons learned would be appreciated yeah so i'm glad well you kind of found me out there where you you're like oh this is this is mystical but also like academic so you kind of found out what i'm trying to do which is kind of bring these more far out ideas that are used in academia, but I want to kind of mix things up a little bit as well and think about just how our imaginary, our idea of like what is possible and what we want the future to be has such strength in the way that we act in the world, the way that be it, you know, doing science, environmental management, ideas of what we want our nation to be or whatever. All of these things, although they're like intangible and imaginaries and ideas, they actually have material impact on the world because that is how we go about acting in the world. So I am really interested in imaginaries and that's what a lot of my work is focused on now. And I'm getting into working on renewable energy imaginaries and things like that. So what I want people to kind of take away from the book is just that it's important to kind of break apart our paradigms that we might have been living in for a long time, you know, and to think about just the possibilities that are out there. And that's kind of where I bring in, you know, these ideas of, you know, let's think 300 years into the future. And like, what do we want our, our environment to look like, you know, let's think really long term. And then work toward that future because we're always working towards a future imaginary. So we might as well just be explicit about it and take steps, you know, to get there. And I think that one place where people have been explicit about it is, you know, some of the tribal sovereignty and movements have been explicit about what they want their future to look like. And so, you know, mixing things up and breaking things open and apart and saying, you know, these dams are probably not going to be there in 300 years because cement doesn't last that long. Let's decide today to imagine more broadly what we want our environmental future to look like and then work towards that. So that's what I hope that people will get out of the book. And that's where I hope that my work is going to be going in the future in more, in more directions of imaginaries. Lovely, right? I just got a little picture in my mind of like post-apocalyptic future where there's like <laughs> dams have just like just started to crumble and, you know, and the and the river's just like making its way, like finding its way. Yeah. <laughs> and like salmon uh-huh. are just hopping over, you know, the, the yep. hopping over it. But yeah, just thinking of the great, I've thought about that recently too, with like great infrastructure, it all has a lifespan. It does. These of d- dam tours, like yeah. of large dams all over the place, Chile and here and everywhere and you know I always ask how I always ask the tour manager you know how long is this dam gonna last you know what's the life expectancy of it and it's always really funny to hear the answer and most of the time they say oh forever you know it's yeah, meant to forever. it's meant to last forever and we're just like yeah. I'm like no I know that it was yeah. not engineered to last Everyone- forever <laughs> 
<laughs> and every, uh, I bet every des- damn designer's dream is like, yes, this will be here forever. Yeah. And then every restorationist dream is like, yes, these trees will be here forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But in the green bit, ba- yeah, I feel like nature based infrastructure, our green infrastructure lasts much longer, but yeah, yeah. I'm not always sure. But yeah, future, I, that's a very optimistic ending. I love that. I think that it provides people with a decent amount of hope. Yeah. <laughs> these days. Well, I do what I can. It's <laughs> good job. All right. Well, thanks for your time. It was really great to meet you. Yeah. And I hope people read the book. And I don't think it's too long. Okay, good. To good. read. It's good. And I I mean, obviously, I'm a reader, but I always, if I could just get, do a little virtue signaling and just yeah. like, I think people should read. If it's not the book, I know in several of your papers are are somewhat, I don't think they're excerpts like word for word, but they're right. very like yeah. applicable and yeah. they really draw specifically is very much content what you would see in the book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I like, I really appreciate you engaging with my work at this depth. It's great to hear that it's meant something to you. And yeah, I appreciate you spreading the word and definitely like you are the audience i was looking for so oh, thank yeah. you no, we're the niche. We're the little, i'm the market i'm the market yes I'm the market. <laughs> thanks for finding tree hugger podcast again the columbia river ecosystem and others you might be more familiar with are changing before our eyes right sorry i'm going to use this term the new normal is change and uncertainty which is constant and challenging to navigate for everyone Shanna politely interrogates the foundations of ecological restoration as setting targets that look backward. She depicts how restorationists are right now reimagining new paradigms by adapting restoration to anticipate and envision a future where an array of actors are actively co-creating that future. I'm grateful that Shanna drove thousands of miles to collect information from folks uncovering the individual insights and connections across communities. She uncovers how people are navigating how to best recover sites or the entire ecosystem amidst environmental change and real loss of ecosystem integrity. The intent is that we bounce back with resiliency stronger and stronger. Often, persistent optimism shines through, but there is also skepticism about the shifting baselines, the funding priorities, etc. So restorationists in response are forming alternative, anticipatory baselines or altering their approaches and tactics. It was really thought-provoking what Shanna describes as imaginaries and how the environment tangles with science and policy. Importantly, Shanna writes that new imaginaries are also emerging, as environmental protection, tribal treaty rights, and environmental justice gain traction. This is really good stuff. Thanks so much to Shannon Lee Hirsch for writing this book. On the next episode of Triarga Podcast, I have a recording of a conversation I had a while back with Dr. Robert Michael Pyle. Bob is an American lepidopterist, writer, teacher, and founder of the Xerce Society for Invertebrate Conservation. A portion of his life was recently featured in a film this summer called The Dark Divide. We chat about the film, his new book of short stories, The Nature Matrix, as well as butterflies, Bigfoot, and beer. Here's a snippet teaser from that discussion. I don't know how I knew you were coming, but you rolled up into this very secure Navy facility, you know, with a gate and a guard. And I do remember we were in the at the greenhouse. I was pretty sure I knew who you were when you rolled up, but then I was like kind of flabbergasted that you negotiated your way past the, into the Boy, into the facility. Much as I was, I was astonished with my uh, my beard and my little uh, my little old Honda. I was amazed that I got into that place. <laughs> Thanks for joining me again for another episode of Tree Hugger Podcast. I'm Michael Yadrick. Please check out the show description for information about Shanna Lee Hirsch, or you can find out more about her online at treehuggerpod.com. We are on social media at treehuggerpod. Subscribe, rate, and review the show, please, on whichever podcast platform you enjoy listening to. You can also just tell someone about the show, which is primitive, organic, very effective. The music for this episode I found on the YouTube audio library. You can find a link to it in the show description. Thanks for hanging out. See you in the woods.
Thank you.